One point of entry into the topic of identity and instant communication is the mask. It's commonly observed that when people go online, they craft their identities, sometimes with little or no relation to the truth. The questions of this gathering, which is to say what is the effect of new technologies on things like the self and self-expression are also the fundamental questions of masking. They are the fundamental questions of masking across time in many places and in many different times. Our own age has certain associations with the mask that are commonly shared. That is to say that masks are worn to disguise, they bring reliable anonymity, they liberate us from social constraints and prohibitions, they give us the permission to be who we truly are. Oscar Wilde said this, man is least himself when he speaks in his own person, give a man a mask and he will tell you the truth. There's a variation of this contemporary view of the mask, and that is that the mask brings a oneness with a larger whole. This is from a short story by Isaac Dinesen written in the 1920s. It's called Carnival. The mask is a little piece of night itself containing all its mystery, depth, and bliss, rightly placed for giving you its freedom without its renunciation. Your center of gravity is moved from the ego to the object. Through the true humility of self-denial, you arrive at an all-comprehending unity with life, and only thus can great works of art be accomplished. We make a mistake when we assume our conceptions of the mask were shared by people before us. That mistake assumes that all the means that allow us to think of masks as transforming our identity into who we truly are were available to them, and these means include economic, medical, technical, political, and social. Only recently, in the age of Oscar Wilde and Isaac Dinesen, could people begin to conceive that they could change their identity when they put on a mask. I believe that to grasp the uses and the constructions and the connotations of masks at any particular time tells us much more about just the masks. So today I'd like to talk about two moments of masking from the past. I'd then like to talk about some observations of the mask of new technologies and see what we can say about the self and self-fashioning. We're looking at an image from the 1790s in Venice. This is an image of a little-known artist by the name of Anton Maria Zanetti, who was sometimes described as an early caricaturist. And I use this image because I acquired this image in this place, the Fondazione Cini, doing research for the book that Roger mentioned. And it's an extraordinary, frightening image that seems to confer our assumptions about masking in Venice. In fact, Venetians wore masks from the late 1600s until the fall of Venice in 1797, six months out of the year. This was the common outfit of maskers in Venice in the 18th century, which is to say a woman on the left, a man on the right, the tricorn hat, a mask that was waxed carton, white waxed carton. The uh, forehead of the mask extended up and you would put the tricorn above the mask and that's what held it on. It came sometimes with the so-called bauta, which is a, a kind of uh, hood that comes under the chin. It was then worn with the cape and then whatever else larger mantle that would cover the finery that uh, people would wear. And this was the topography of Venice for over 100 years between generally October and Lent, that is to say the end of the carnival season. Here's a beautiful etching of a lamplighter. It comes from a book about the professions and occupations of Venice. This was a lamplighter necessary because the bridges did not have sides on them. And so you, when it's night, you want to have someone with a lamp carrying so you can go over the bridges and not fall into the canals. But it's a, it's a wonderful image of two maskers going to the theater in Venice, as it says in the base. And I mentioned the theater because people in Venice wore masks to the theater during plays. And this is a, this is a wonderful image taken from a, uh, one of the volumes of Goldoni's plays. And this is 
the ticket booth of the theater as they're about to enter the theater. And as I say, there are good images of audiences wearing masks in the theater. Here are maskers in a cafe, very common in cafes at the time as well. Here's an interesting image of maskers in the Doge's palace. Because by tradition, foreign ambassadors always wore masks when they mingled with Venetian patricians. And so what we see here is a formal dinner given to Venetian patricians. You can see them around the perimeter of the room at their tables. You can see the Doge and the High Council, the Ducal Council at an elevated table at the back. And you can see foreign ambassadors in the middle of the room milling about wearing masks. The tradition of wearing masks began with the nobility in the 1690s that quickly spread to most other classes except the workers. And here's a nice image of people in public. We have a woman selling perfume. It's an uh, image by uh, Longhi. And uh, we have various maskers here as well. Masks were the norm in Venice outside of the carnival season. Venetians wore masks for occasions that were not festive. It was an accepted article of clothing. It was cheap. It was easily had. It was simple. Most of the time, Venetians wore masks not to be mysterious, not to pursue clandestine affairs, not to be provocative or defiant. And so we have to ask why. Masks were a manifestation of an extremely hierarchical social structure. We heard a bit last night about the patrician tradition in Venice. In 1297, the noble class was locked in the famous Serata. And from 1297 until 1797, it was cracked open only on two or three occasions to finance wars. Otherwise, there was no social mobility and a relative handful of non-nobles purchased their way into the noble class. Unlike France, in which the door was wide open from the time of Louis XIII forward and people were always buying nobility, there was a sense of an immutable hierarchy. You were who you were born to be. And the noble distinction of nobles and commoners was strictly policed through marriage laws, through inheritance laws, through dress, Speaking of dress, this is a beautiful book from a book of fashions from the late 17th century, engravings of various fashions. And we saw one of these noble stoles in one of the cases last night in the Palazzo. Strictly enforced, I said, through laws regarding marriage, inheritance, and also behavior. Because you might notice in the background of this image, here's a detail. A nobleman being greeted by a commoner, by a non-noble. So that there was very little mingling in this city of a strict, unchanging, immutable hierarchy. And there was always the notion of deference, an acknowledgement in public, often wordlessly, of a society of ranks. Mask appeared, as I said, in the later 17th century. There were other things that appeared in the later 17th century in this city, some of them historic. You know, perhaps, that this was the city where there was the first public theater, 16. 37, and the first public performance of opera in an enclosed space. Later in the 17th century, cafes appeared as they were appearing in other European cities. Cafes, many cafes in the, near the Piazza San Marco appeared. And also, in the very late 1690s, the public gambling hall appeared. And this is something fundamentally new. This is something in which people come together in public places that are enclosed and small and the quarters are close. Masks therefore first appeared in theaters when nobles sat next to commoners. Yes, there were boxes along the walls, but on the floor there were benches. And a librettist that, whose account of this from the 17th century, whose book I Read, I came across this particular passage, which he says, each night the seats are sold on the ground level without distinctions among spectators, for the use of masks removes the need for respect. That's a demonstration of respect. But the use of masks removes the need for respect. It does not disguise identities, but it excuses 
non-nobles from acknowledging nobles as such, and it permits nobles to go without expecting it. In other words, it lubricates the wheels of a transaction that would be very cumbersome otherwise. The six-month theater season from October until Lent was when people wore masks functionally to sit in cafes and gambling and mingle in gambling halls and to sit in the theater functionally, which then became encoded in law so that masks were legally permitted for that six-month period, and again for two weeks in the summer coinciding with a two-week theater season, and otherwise not permitted. The function becomes tradition, becomes law. But still you ask, why masks in particular? It's a strange tradition. And the answer, I think, is that this was one of the only cities in Italy in which women veiled themselves and beggars masked themselves. If you read the rhetoric of why women veiled themselves, it was not about patronizing desire of the husband. The rhetoric then was not about a patriarchy that was demeaning to women. The women described it as giving them independence, which they would not otherwise have. The veil did not disguise them, but it gave them a kind of psychological distance and depth. And the same was said about beggars in masks. This image is from the 18th century. It's from an artist who commented on the images he drew of all the people he saw in Venice. And he identifies this particular beggar. He says what was written on the sheet in front of the beggar, which gives the beggar's name. And the artist says we all knew him because he was an administrator just below the noble class who fell into poverty. But he wore the mask so that we will not have to acknowledge his identity. This writer says he would blush to ask for alms to feed the poor we would blush to ask for alms. We would blush feeding, giving him alms for the poor. He says the mask is compassionate. It reflects our goodwill. So again, it's not a disguise, but it's a token anonymity. And that's what the Venetian mask did then. It gave a token anonymity for functional reasons that become tradition, formal wear that does not require disguise. Of course, there were times when masks masked. Of course, there were thieves who masked themselves for their thievery. There were clandestine affairs that pursued unmasking. But the point of the Venetian mask is it did not depend on masking. It was a, an agreed upon fiction. A good example of this is the ambassadors in the image we saw before. It was illegal for foreign ambassadors to speak to patrician Venetians. But if they had the mask, then it wasn't entirely happening. And also the mask permitted a contact which would otherwise not be permitted. And in the context of cafes, people had conversations they would not otherwise have. It's a kind of plausible deniability. The best example of this I saw was reading in the French diplomatic archives the correspondence of the French ambassador to Venice in the 18th century, writing in code back to Louis XV. And he says, we all gathered with the Venetian patricians and I spoke to the doge. We were both masked, which allowed us to speak sincerely. There's no sense in the Venetian mask that it is used to defy and to mock. This is also true of Venetian Carnival, by the way, another great myth that we hold dear that Venetian Carnival is about topsy-turvy, defiance, mockery. It's not. Rather, in this formal attire, used as such, it was not used to discover one's true self, which was unimaginable to most Venetians, that that's a question could be posed. Instead, it was a kind of mask that permitted community, that is to be with others in a society that nevertheless remained strictly hierarchical, even during Carnival. In short, the Mask of Venice was conservative. Now, I want to go to one other moment to have a glance at a kind of masking that's very different. I want to move from the object to the idea or the figure of mask. I want to go to the French fin de siècle, that is, France in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. I want to skip over the 1830s in France, which was the period of great commercial masked balls that happened week after week after week in which people did disguise themselves 
They did imagine other identities. It was chaotic and it was politically subversive. I want to skip over that to a later period of masking in France. And many of you will know this painting, Manet, Bal Masqué à l'Opéra, 1873. The later period in France is a period of greater conformity in which the physical mask disappears. And this is an image of the commercial ball at the opera, which the opera room held, and we see very few masks. We actually think we see very few masks, but the fact is, I found accounts in the opera archives that there were stores and boutiques around the opera building that rented tuxedos and formal top hats to working class men so that they could go to the mask ball unmasked. But this is an age of great conformity and it's an age when the so-called sexual freedom of the 1830s and 40s becomes a, a naked business transaction. And then it captures sort of this, sort of this thing. Um, I want to move to this period to look at the mask as a figure, that is to say, a mask used by novelists, by painters, by intellectuals, by that generation that is discontent with the naturalism of Emile Zola, the generation that's discontent with what they called soul-destroying science, discontent with rationality, discontent with the coming democracy and the vulgar tastes of the masses who rejected photography, and Cartesian clarity. For this generation, the mask is the figure of existential uncertainty. It's not formal, it's not festive, it's not really about imposture or willful deceit, but it's about the unconscious realm, the unknown realm, the sickly, the unhealthy, the emerging sway and language of the psyche, which is being investigated by Dr. Charcot at the Salpetriere Hospital with hypnosis of so-called hysterical women, the private worlds that offered a fearful relief from reality, which is to say behind the false face of propriety is aimlessness and ennui, a thirst for violence, sexual deviance, madness. This is an image from a sculptor by the name of Pierre-Félix Massio. It's called L'Emprise. We might describe it as stranglehold. 1894. This is the figure of the mask in the fin de siècle, and it's conveyed in many interesting ways. Another way that this figure of the mask is conveyed is in the poetry of Paul Verlaine. Many of you will know his collection, his early collection, Fête Galante, which is to reproduce in some imagined way the world of Versailles in the 18th century, and that famous first poem, Claire de Lune, that begins, Vos Est un paysage choisi que vont charmant, masque et bergamasque. The first stanza is, your soul is a choice landscape where masks and bergamasques pass entrancing, playing lutes and dancing, slightly sad in their strange costumes. This is a masked drama in the inner landscape. It's played within the self populated by clowns who are no longer comic. It was seen as a condition of the age. It's an image painted by the Belgian painter, James Ensor, Christ's entry into Brussels. Ensor was fascinated, morbidly fascinated by the condition of the mask and he portrayed it again and again series of works with faces that look like masks, haunted, corrupt, perhaps the image of a degenerate civilization, modern life is a perpetual carnival of the mad and the depraved. This is from a letter of James Ensor to a friend. My subjects are personnage terrifié, at once insolent and timid, grumbling or barking, their voices a thin falsetto or an unhinged trumpet, their heads like ghastly beasts, and their sudden gestures like wild animals. When I saw this repulsive surging humanity, my heart shook and my bones trembled. I grasped the enormity and the distortions and I glimpsed the modern spirit. A new world has appeared. 
This is another image of James Ensor. This is Pierrot with skeletons. An image of joyless masks. Around the time Verlaine wrote Fête Galante, he wrote a poem, an eight-line poem called Pierrot. It was not published until much later, 25 years later. This is the poem. He is no longer the moonstruck dreamer from the olden days who mocks his betters in the upper gallery. His joy, alas, like his candle, is dead, and his ghost haunts us today, thin and clear. There he stands in the shock of light. His pale shirt, blown open in the cold wind, looks like a shroud, and his mouth gapes as if screaming from the sting of maggots. To some in this period, the mask was a portal to another inner world, a truer world. This is an image of the decadent author Jean Lorrain. And for Jean Lorrain and his characters, masks are at once overpowering and repulsing. He wrote a series of short stories. He collected them in 1900, and he called the collection Histoire de Masques. Masks, he said, were the turbid, troubling face of the unknown. They are lust laced with fear, the delicious and tormenting risk embraced on a dare from one's curious senses. The narrator of the opening story of the Histoire des Masques sings a, sees a solitary masker in a train. They're headed to the suburbs. It's the end of the opera ball. This masker has a hooded cloak, women's hosiery, a slipper, on one foot, a man's stocking and shoe on the other foot, a silver mask covering his face, and he's holding a mirror, gazing at his own reflection for the length of the journey. The narrator writes, what instincts, what appetites, what hopes, what cravings, what illnesses of the soul reside beneath the false features of the gaudily colored carton, beneath the bristles of the false beards, glistening satin, and the white fabric of the hood. But for Lorraine, this was an analogy, because masks were everywhere. He wrote another novel, Monsieur de Foucault, 1901. And the narrator, this is a novel written in the form of a journal, the, the, the narrator becomes obsessed with masks he sees in the streets, and he begins to have obsessive thoughts about decapitation with every mask he sees. April 1893, masks, he writes. I see masks in the streets. I see masks on stage at the theater. I find them again at the box seats. They're in the balcony. I find them in the orchestra. The ushers who hand me my overcoat wear masks. Maskers show themselves outside at the exit, and the coachman who drives me home has this same cardboard grimace affixed to his face. Lorraine was not alone in using the mask as a figure for terror and derangement. This is an image by the artist Felician Rop, R-O-P-S. Uh, this is somewhat standard. It's a, an ambiguous trope about hypocrisy. He often allies in his images the mask with often misogynistic eroticism. This is called Ecce Diabola Mulier. It's a similar message in a much more sinister register. Not Ecce Homo, Ecce Diabola Mulier. Behold the she devil. The transparent, the transparent skirt that she wears seems to give us a warning. She is seemingly unclothed, she's holding a mask, but she is not unmasked. What is the nature of masks in the French fin de siècle? It's at once a commentary on society and on the self. Regarding society, it is an effect. It's an effect of the city, of herd-like democracy, of anomie and alienation, of Americanization, they said, which transformed human relations into business relations. The mask was an obstacle to community 
It was an obstacle to concord and mutual understanding. And regarding the psyche, the mask was a discovery, a figure for the fathomless self, a self that could reveal itself only in partial glimpses of dreams, of hypnosis, of states of intoxication or hallucination, of sexual depravity. It was a self politicians were realizing that could be roused irrationally to mass passions, which included social hatred, class hatred, racial hatred, and violence. But in both cases, the mask is a condition and not a choice. It presumes a self. It's a mask that works against narcissism in quest of the self, and it does not preclude the possibility that the self is ultimately unknowable. It's an object of doom and fascination. Our contemporary view, where I began with Oscar Wilde and Isaac and Isaac Dinesen, is the heir of this version of the mask, which is to say the mask of self-fashioning. It's made conceivable and possible by our prosperity, our rhetoric of political democracy and social equality, and by consumerism. And the mask of technology, of new technologies, is a further step in a radical self-fashioning. We know the notion of complete visibility. There's a strange combination about new technologies, which is limitless visibility and complete self-invention, reinvention, and imposture. The two aspects of the online identity, full visibility and continued self-reinvention. We're familiar with the mask of new technologies. We're familiar with FBI agents posing as adolescents, arranging trysts with adult pedophiles posing as adolescents. But we're familiar with the much more common sort of self-reinvention. Our online profiles are crafted so they include the most flattering photos, the most thrilling travels, nourished by the most amazing meals, accompanied by the most glamorous friends. People talk about the internet of people, lives that are fully displayed online through Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, and Twitter. In 2012, there were an estimated 5 billion held, handheld devices. In 2020, there will be 50 billion handheld devices. Facebook now has more active followers than the entire population of Europe and Russia. Each month on Facebook, there are more than 1 trillion, 1 trillion page views. This consists of continuous posts of personal information, family, friends, loved ones, lovers, a daily, sometimes hourly photographic archive, a catalog of what one buys, reads, watches, listens to, constant updates of one's location where one is walking, driving, flying, eating, and sleeping. And much of this radical exhibitionism is done by choice. Mark Zuckerberg described a five-year plan in 2010. It was to eliminate loneliness. He said, no matter where you go, we want to ensure that every experience you have will be social. He was the person of the year of Time magazine in 2010. And this is from the description of the choice of his being person of the year from Time magazine. Facebook wants to turn the lonely, anti-social world of random chance into a friendly, serendipitous world. You'll be working and living inside a network of people, and you'll never have to be alone again. The internet and the whole world will feel more like a family, or a college dorm, or an office where your co-workers are also your best friends. Much of the data is collected not by choice. As of 2011, iPhones track, record, and archive location data every day, up to 100 times a day, at all times. There are now new apps that collect data on one's activities, conversations, time spent working, time spent exercising, time spent eating, time spent sleeping. 
They then put these into prose for you and post it automatically in real time. This is from the website of one of these app companies. It's called Step Journal. Want to know yourself better? Step Journal assists you in capturing and telling the amazing story of your life. Life poetry told by censors. The true power of amazing journalism. journaling. This is from Saga, a rival company. Be bold. Embrace your authentic self. Record your life automatically and share it effortlessly with people you care about. And then there's the narrative clip, which is a small camera that you affix on a part of your clothing, and it takes photos every 30 seconds. This is from the website. Capture the moment as it happens without interference. Complement your staged photos of majestic scenery with the intensity of the small moments that matter the most. There's an app that by placing your smartphone on the bed measures, records, and posts automatically your sex life, including its frequency, duration of encounters, the number of thrusts, and decibel levels. It's called Spreadsheets. Much has been said and commented upon upon the dangers of data collection, dangers posed by government surveillance, by corporations. But what about its implications for these themes of the conference, identity, creativity, and self-expression? In 1890, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis wrote an article in the Harvard Law Review that sketched out a new notion of the right to privacy. They described a worry of a new style of journalism in this new technology of the camera that, as they write, would make what is whispered in the closet proclaimed from the housetops. In this article, they said that these inventions and the new business methods and motivations make, and I'm quoting, solitude and privacy all the more essential to the individual. They write of the general right of immunity of the person the right to one's personality. And it was this logic that then Justice Brandeis used in Olmsted versus the United States in 1928 to argue in the minority that there was a right to privacy against governmental surveillance. That law, thankfully, was, that judgment, thankfully, was overturned in the 1960s to say that there is a right to privacy. Full visibility erodes the immunity of the person. It transfers one's personality from the private self to online platforms. This is a self that is now in various degrees ranging from slightly to irretrievably curated, fragmented, quantified, falsified, diminished, and unmoored. It's an enduring ephemeral that will last long after we are dead. My sister died at age 39, 18 years ago. And for whatever reason, I typed her name in to Google not long ago to learn that she lives at the address where she last lived, and she's 57 years old. There's a certain amount that's been said about narcissism in this new self. I'm not quite sure this is right, or maybe it needs to be modified. If there's narcissism, it's a narcissism combined with the servility to the avatar. And the risk is that this mask, not always under our control, becomes our self. Cosmetic surgeons now report that patients show them selfies taken with phones with apps that take away their wrinkles and slim them and ask to be operated on so that they look more like themselves. Finally, we must realize that the audience for the continuously generated self-portrait, which are automatic updates, including driving habits and health data, the audience for these self-portraits is software. Software that generates reports that are analyzed by insurers, employers, marketeers, intelligence communities, and the rest of the friendly, serendipitous world made up of people who are our best friends. We've looked at four types of masks. The mask of Venice, which was protective. It permitted contact and commerce otherwise impossible. 
We've looked at the mask of the Fanta Siecla, which announced and plumbed inner depths. We've looked at the contemporary mask of Oscar Wilde and Nizak Dinesen, who spoke of the true humility of self-denial that brings all comprehending unity with life. And she wrote, only thus can great works of art be accomplished. None of these three masks risks the immunity of the person or the right to one's personality. None of these masks empty the self in the way that new technologies risk doing. This final image is from Lorenzo Lippi. It's a woman holding a mask and a pomegranate. She's just removed her mask or she's about to don it. Her finger covers the mouth of the mask. But then as we look at it, we realize that the face reveals nothing more than the mask would permit if she were wearing the mask. Her face is about what's hidden. We see the pomegranate that's split open and we see luscious red seeds inside the exterior of the pomegranate. And this is a woman whose mask, whether it's the object or the face, holds interior secrets. New technologies may leave us with no such secrets and worse, they may leave us incapable of imagining what it is to possess them. <laughs>